From rugged mountain peaks to pristine forests, from glistening oceans to the earthy hues of arid deserts, for those who are willing to seek it out, America unveils endless beauty at nearly every turn, and nowhere is that more apparent than in its more than 400 national parks. Most people are familiar with the scenic vistas of the Grand Canyon or the monolithic wonders of Rocky Mountain National Park. One park that had largely been forgotten, however, has recently returned to the surface of public consciousness. As its name suggests, Mystery Flesh Pit National Park was a place of otherworldly appeal. It not only informed the public of one of the world's greatest natural mysteries, it also contained life forms found nowhere else on the planet. Unfortunately for anyone wishing to visit today, Mystery Flesh Pit National Park is no longer open to the public. Following a well-publicized disaster in 2007, the park ceased operations and for the last 14 years, this place of natural beauty has been quarantined. Rather than welcome centers and helpful park staff, curious visitors will now find only electrified fences and ominous warnings to stay away. Still, life within the park goes on. Though no human presence remains within the park itself, the ecosystem sustained by the Permian Basin superorganism is alive and well, though the organism itself lies blessedly dormant once more. Those who were fortunate enough to visit the park prior to the 2007 disaster may recall that the superorganism is host to an abundance of other creatures, most of them little understood. Today we'll be taking a look at some of the most famous examples of fauna within Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Of course, some may consider these creatures to be disturbing, some even going so far as to call them abominations. But like all forms of life on this planet, each of these organisms have their own unique beauty to offer. Before we begin our descent into the park though, I'd like to take just a moment to thank the sponsor of this expedition, World of Warships. World of Warships is a free-to-play game of team-based battles that take place entirely at sea, and it's now available on PC. And because each match is different, you'll need to summon every ounce of strategizing your brain can muster, especially when you play against your friends in Division. Trust me, you're going to be blown away by all the options here. You'll find over 400 unique ships, many of which are digital versions of real, historic ships, and you can control them through gorgeous maps with living, changing landscapes, even down to the weather. Of course, if you'd like to fully customize your own ship, this game has you covered. You'll find five different warship types, destroyers, battleships, cruisers, aircraft carriers, and even submarines. And with more than 44 million people currently playing World of Warships, you'll never miss out on a challenge to test your abilities. And if that wasn't enough, you'll find time-limited events and missions like the time they gave players the ability to team up with Godzilla and King Kong. You know, the one from Skull Island. All of this, and it's free to play. Download the game using the first link in the description. As you register through that link, use the code FIRE to get an enormous starter pack. This thing includes 200 doubloons, premium battleship USS Texas, 20 times restless fire camouflage, 1 million credits, and 7 days of premium account, all for free. Again, thank you to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. It is very much appreciated. Links are in the description. For a bit of context, let's begin our exploration with a brief history of the park. Though legends of the Permian Basin superorganism are thought to trace back a couple of hundred years, it wasn't until 1973 that this amazing creature entered the public awareness. A surveyor named James Jackson was exploring an area near Gumption, Texas when he happened to come across what is now known as the Entry Orifice, a large mouth-like cavern that seemed to be alive, breathing, and according to Jackson, bleeding. As it turned out, this was just one entrance to what became known as the Permian Basin Superorganism, an ancient and unimaginably large creature that slumbered beneath the Texas soil. In the years since its discovery, ownership of the land surrounding the orifice passed to Anodyne Incorporated before being absorbed into the National Park System in 1980 under the Special Resources Development Act. Under government management, the park was transformed into a kind of natural resort, and for nearly three decades it was a popular tourist destination. Visitors could descend inside the orifice, which, thanks to the efforts of some brave engineers, had been dilated and expanded, allowing for the construction of multiple visitor centers and even a backcountry trail system. Throughout these expansions, and as scientists began to learn more about this superorganism's anatomy, it quickly became clear that it was far larger than anyone had initially dreamed but we'll come back to that in a little while. It was also clear that the superorganism itself had become a host to a whole ecosystem of smaller organisms. Many of these creatures lived their entire life cycle within the superorganism, while others would occasionally venture out to the surface, posing a hazard for any would-be visitors. As we explore these creatures in more detail, you'll likely notice that many of them bear a striking resemblance to creatures found in Earth's oceans. 
This observation has perplexed scientists for years, though at this time it's theorized that at some point in the very distant past, perhaps early in its life cycle, the superorganism was aquatic. During this time, it may have swallowed other life forms which, left to evolve in this little understood climate of the organism's body, adapted to become the creatures we see today. These adaptations occur in ways unlike anywhere else on Earth, not just because of this unique environment, but also because the body of this superorganism appears to facilitate some very odd biological alterations. One such example is the iconic amorphous shame. These strange creatures live their entire lives nestled into folds or pockets within the flesh pit. Fully adapted to this environment, they have no need of skin, eyes, or even bones. But although they appear to be nothing more than an ungainly clump of organs, scientists theorize that the amorphous shame actually shares a common ancestor with the long-tailed weasel. At some point, roughly 14.8 million years ago, this weasel precursor likely entered an orifice of the Permian Basin superorganism. Many generations later, deep within the flesh pit, this common ancestor is now known as Mustella subterrana. Its body has elongated, enabling it to navigate the pit's tight folds. By 4 million years ago, Mustella subterrana has become hairless, toothless, and blind. Eventually, it gained the ability to metabolize liquid bolus from within the organism itself. Presently, the amorphous shame is completely unrecognizable as a descendant of small surface-dwelling mammals. To eat, it simply extends a siphon tube appendage outside of whatever small orifice it inhabits, allowing it to consume liquid aminos and proteins from within the superorganism's anatomy. You may be wondering how these bizarre creatures, which have no method of locomotion, are able to reproduce. Well, thanks to the fact that these creatures dwell within a living being, they are occasionally squeezed or vomited out of the flesh pockets they inhabit. When this occurs, environmental peristalsis moves them along slowly until they happen upon another place to take up residence. These new homes may be inhabited by other amorphous shames, sometimes even of the opposite gender. The two shames locate each other via the use of pheromones, at which point a frenzied copulation ritual aided by what little musculature remains in their bodies takes place. The sight of these two creatures vigorously engaging in a mating ritual is, as recounted by early explorers and miners, really something you shouldn't see twice. But the bizarre anatomy of the shame is only one example of the extreme adaptations that have occurred within the superorganism, and it doesn't always take millions of years. As previously mentioned, on rare occasions certain creatures from within the flesh pit will ascend to the surface to hunt, dragging their prey back down with them. If the surface fauna isn't immediately eaten, it may undergo a fascinating process known as anatomical amalgamation. This results in the creation of so-called compound organisms, multiple creatures that have become fused together. No one knows exactly how this process occurs, but in most situations, the lives of these compound fauna are mercifully short. Still, park visitors were strongly advised not to feed the compound fauna lest they prolong their suffering. But the surface-dwelling animals weren't the only organisms to be grafted into these compounds. Rarely, rangers or visitors would stumble across an amalgam that contained humans. It's unknown how many people suffered this fate in modern times, but there are a few known cases of humans who were extracted from an amalgamation. A highly experimental procedure was developed in the 1980s by Baylor Medical Center, which involved identifying which organs and tissues within the amalgamation were human, and if more than one human, which organs and tissues had differing DNA sequencing. Where possible, these organs, including the brain, were then carefully extracted and through the use of proprietary chemical solutions and machine interfaces, placed on a kind of intensive life support. In at least one situation, an extracted individual was able to communicate via a text-based computer readout. Unfortunately, the cost of this procedure was prohibitive and the patient's quality of life was horrific. As a result, these extractions were rarely performed. Due to medical privacy laws, it is unknown how many, if any, of the individuals who underwent this procedure are still alive today. But perhaps the most well-known of the flesh pit's fauna is the abyssal copepod. These creatures were likely the ones described by James Jackson himself in a sketch dated 1973. You might think that they look like a kind of large lobster or shrimp, and you'd be pretty close. Indeed, abyssal copepods are members of the arthropod family, which includes spiders, insects, and of course, crustaceans. Unlike their ocean-dwelling counterparts, though, abyssal copepods have fully adapted to life within the flesh pit. For example, though they share the same tough exoskeleton as their relatives, in pit-dwelling copepods, it is coated with a waxy substance that allows them to slide between folds of flesh with ease. And though they tend to stay far away from light and noise and are therefore a rare sight for visitors, their sheer size makes them otherwise hard to miss. An adult can reach up to 20 feet in length and weigh more than 310 pounds. 
Most abyssal copepods, however, are a bit smaller, with the average length being around 6 feet. Still, if you happen across one, it's best to keep your distance. One of the most startling aspects of these creatures' anatomy are two very specialized appendages located near the front of their body. Unlike other arthropods, which may possess claws or pincers, these skeletal manipulators look very similar to human hands. Even stranger, unlike the rest of their chitin-covered bodies, these appendages are unarmored and are covered in a thin, semi-translucent skin that is stretched tightly over a bony frame consisting of two major joints and a hand, made up of four fingers and an opposable thumb. These hands are used to grasp and choke their prey, which, after losing consciousness, are dragged away for feeding. The striking morphological discontinuity between these arms and the rest of their biology has been the subject of much scientific debate, and some have even gone so far as to theorize that the abyssal copepod is an example of a kind of successful amalgamation between humans and arthropods. Though this disturbing thought is not outside the realm of possibility, most scientists are hesitant to accept it. Even still, the mysteries of the flesh pit are vast, and almost nothing about what we do know is for certain. One of the least understood creatures within the superorganism is known by several names. Suckling sprites, buggins, or most commonly, the gasp owl. These organisms live only within the deepest reaches of the so far explored areas of the pit, and as a result, little is known about them. These little animals get their name from a characteristically labored breathing and from the common thought that they are descended from an avian ancestor. Of course, unlike the amorphous shame, no genetic studies have been conducted as to the gasp owl's lineage, so this is speculation at best. By nature, gasp owls are both shy and inquisitive. Sadly, since the park's closure in 2007, research on these unique creatures has effectively halted. Hopefully this research will be allowed to continue in the future, but for now, we'll have to be content to let the gasp owls live on in our imaginations. One of the most common species found within the former park is now known as the mesoglial tridecapod. To many park rangers and service crew, these fascinating creatures were considered a nuisance thanks to their tendency to congregate around and damage electrical conduits and wiring. Tridecapods are so named because of their 13 legs, 12 of which are used for locomotion. The 13th leg, on the other hand, is covered in keratinous plates and bears a similarity to a head, but rather than housing eyes or ears, this head features two sensory ganglia, which are highly sensitive to electric field gradients. This allows the tridecapod to navigate through the superorganism's anatomy with extreme precision. Interestingly, mesoglial tridecapods are hemovores, meaning that they obtain vital nutrients from the blood of the superorganism. Using their very specialized mouthparts, tridecapods are able to slice open one of the organism's vessels, ingest the blood, extract the nutrients, and then eject the filtered blood back into the vessel. When they're done feeding, they secrete a resin that seals the incision, causing only a negligible strain on the superorganism's body. Not surprisingly, this led to the common conception that the mesoglial tridecapods are dangerous vampires. In fact, it was the human presence within the pit that was dangerous for these creatures. The tridecapods would often mistake electrical conduits for vessels, causing them to be fatally electrocuted and causing costly downtime for park infrastructure. So far, we've discussed some relatively common creatures within the flesh pit, but the most common by far is actually a group of organisms collectively known as macrobacteria. Unlike microbacteria, these creatures are multicellular and can reach very large sizes, some up to 12 feet in diameter. In fact, despite their name, the macrobacteria found within the former park are not bacteria at all, but again pointing to a former aquatic superorganism, they are a species of echinoderms. Over the millennia, it's believed that these echinoderms developed the ability to feast on cystic nutrient ganglions found within the pit via osmotic diffusion. In fact, visitors could often observe colonies of these macrobacteria clustered around these nutrient cysts. While the park was open, it was clear that macrobacteria pose little threat to humans as they tend to be almost entirely passive. Still, any visitor to the pit was warned not to approach and to never touch them as they could easily fall into and become suffocated by the macrobacteria's oral groove. Now we've come to the main attraction of the entire park, and the reason for its establishment, Immanus Colossius, the Permian Basin superorganism itself. Though it was formally described in the 1970s, it's possible that Native Americans were aware of its history long before that. An oral legend from the Caddo people is described as follows. The favor of the Great Spirit rested on the abundant forest, flowers, songbirds, and small animals of these quiet hills. Then a fierce dragon devastated the land, bringing disease and hunger and hatred and greed on the people. The Indian nations pleaded with the Great Spirit to subdue the dragon into a deep slumber, and the might of all the heavenly forces contrived to bury it under the world, where it shakes the earth even today. 
Unfortunately, despite oral traditions like these and decades of exploration within the organism itself, scientists have only been able to scratch the surface. It is unknown where the organism came from, how long it has been here, and even how large it truly is. In fact, the superorganism's size has been the subject of quite a bit of debate. Surveys suggest that its body extends hundreds of miles horizontally, just beneath the upper layer of the Permian Basin. But just how far down does its body extend? Well, the simple fact is that we don't know. The depth record for a human was achieved in 1979 when an expedition team was able to reach a depth of 19,012 meters, or about 11 miles. At this depth, the anatomy of the superorganism changes drastically, and further human exploration is deemed too dangerous. Unmanned probes have made it slightly farther, but disruptions in communications have made it impossible to continue. This is due in large part to one of the superorganism's least understood physiological aspects, blue tissue. As its name implies, this type of tissue is a soft, blue, non-Newtonian liquid tissue layer located at the farthest known depths of biostrata. Its purpose in the superorganism's anatomy is unknown. It is extremely corrosive, leading many scientists to believe that it may be utilized by the superorganism to break down subterranean hydrocarbon deposits. Still, despite the lack of physical confirmation, it is hypothesized that the pit may well extend into the Earth's mantle, with many scientists suggesting that the organism may be native to the interior of the planet, having merely surfaced to the upper tectonic plates for unknown reasons. Beyond that, very little is known about the superorganism. Even the shape of the creature is a matter of debate, as the known portions of its body exhibit no symmetry or other observable pattern. As far as the internal biology of the superorganism, tissue samples suggest that its body is made up of vascular, respiratory, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, nervous, limbic, and integumentary systems that are similar to mammals. Of course, there are also many more systems that have no analogous properties to other organisms, and even its method of feeding is not understood. It's possible that the superorganism undergoes cycles of feeding and dormancy, or it could be sustained by the breakdown of subterranean hydrocarbon deposits facilitated by the previously mentioned blue tissue. And though we don't know how far the organism extends into the Earth, what we do know seems to indicate that it is at least several hundred thousand years old, but does that mean it's a mature adult or a juvenile? For now, questions like these are little more than complete speculation. And though it's lay dormant beneath the earth for thousands of years, the incident in 2007, which caused the death of so many, may indicate that a resurfacing of this colossal organism is only a matter of time. So far, we've looked at the most famous examples of fauna within the former national park, but of course there are many more. Unfortunately, organisms like the Venus shamble, gastric bristleworm, ballast sirens, and many more have barely been studied at all. Until scientists are able to study these creatures in more detail, we'll have to be content with drawings like these. The beauty of Mystery Flesh Pit National Park is undeniable, but as those who remember the incident in 2007 can attest, it isn't without its dangers. Like any national park, it's a wild place and a reminder that despite our best efforts, nature cannot be contained. Hopefully, we'll be able to learn more about the Permian Basin superorganism and the stunning variety of wildlife that calls it home. Until then, though, don't try to visit on your own. Despite its beauty, as the sign states, nothing beyond the fence is worth dying for. And if you'd like to learn more about the now-defunct Mystery Flesh Pit National Park, including reports of the 2007 disaster, be sure to visit the creator's official Tumblr and Patreon pages, which will be linked in the description. And thanks again to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. Those links are also in the description. And as always, thanks for watching.